because I potentially uh, sometimes have um, screaming cats in the background. So I'm gonna just, I'm just gonna mute. Okay. Good plan. Almost halfway there. Okay. Oh, we're, not there. we're not live yet. We're live now. So I'm gonna I'm gonna mute myself until we get to the to my part just because. Okay. <laughs> that was recorded. I'll come back and then resume recording, and we're on. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and start. Um, although, actually, it does start with there's 30 more seconds. Maybe we should wait. You know what? I'll, I'll give a brief intro, and then I'll give another brief intro in 30 seconds. Um, so first, for those of you who are on now, um, we are going to be, there's three speakers, and we're going to be doing question and answers at the end. So if you do have any questions, those of you not familiar with Zoom, you'll see there's a Q&A box usually at the bottom of your screen. Please, as you go, type in questions, and then at the end, we'll be looking through all the questions, and we'll answer as many as we can. Um, so welcome to the climate change webinar. This is part of the uh, Sustainable Fairfield Task Force Earth Week uh, programming. This is being streamed live to YouTube, so if you want to watch it again, you're more than welcome to watch it on YouTube. But we're going to have, we're lucky to have um, two great speakers who are going to be joining me today. I am Becky Bunnell. I'm on the Sustainable Fairfield Task Force. I'm also the chair of the Flood and Erosion Control Board for the Town of Fairfield. And um, I will be speaking a little bit about sort of the uh, a little bit about the global impact of climate change, but really focusing on what we're going to be seeing in the state of Connecticut and particularly in Fairfield, the town of Fairfield, uh, what the what the what those impacts of climate change that are most likely to impact us and what we're doing about it. Um, I will then turn it over to Juliana Barrett, who is with the uh, University of Connecticut Sea Grant College program, and she will talk about other aspects of climate change um, that I won't be covering, um, sort of marshes and living shorelines and other areas, um, vector-borne diseases and stuff that will be um, helpful to, to hear about and what we should be expecting. And then she will turn it over to Emmeline Harrigan, who is our assistant planning director for the town of Fairfield. She is also a certified uh, floodplain manager. And she will be specifically talking about the POCD, which is our plan of conservation and development, and uh, what, what ways we will be looking at that vehicle as a way to think about how we, how we deal with climate change over the 10-year horizon. And she'll go into a lot more detail about that. So with that, I am going to try to share my screen and walk through a brief presentation, which hopefully, I don't know why it's not going into screen view. Oh, wait, I need to get out of that, sorry. And let me bring it to the beginning because of course I didn't start it. So obviously we're really good at this. All right. so. Climate Change Discussion, Earth Day 2020. Again, thank you for joining. And for those of you who may have just joined, uh, there's gonna be three presenters and we'll be taking question and answers at the end. So please um, go to the bottom of your screen and type in any questions you have and we will walk through them at the end. Thank you very much. So what I will be doing uh, briefly in the first part of this is a, quickly, a quick look at the global impacts of climate change, um, but really focusing specifically on, on what we should be seeing in the town of Fairfield, Connecticut, what impacts we would be most uh, influenced by, um, which really are sea level projections, increased rain events and storm intensity projections, and what Fairfield is doing to address this. So from a big global standpoint, climate change is gonna really have a huge impact on our world. I mean, it's gonna displace probably over, certainly over a billion people. It's gonna have major impacts to our ecosystems, our habitats, our animals. We're gonna see heat waves, more drought, more wildfires, precipitation events, sea level rise. There's tons of things that we are gonna see if we can't find a way to mitigate and, uh, and minimize the impact of climate change as we go forward. But the ones that we talk about the most in the town of Fairfield um, and that's gonna impact us the most is the projections for sea level rise in Connecticut. So uh, CIRCA, which is um, the uh, offshoot of the University of Connecticut has a group that has been doing wonderful work looking at all these different kinds of resiliency impacts. And um, James O'Donnell, who is the executive director of CIRCA and his team have developed a sea level rise model that looks at a high, high sea level scenario, a low sea level scenario, and then several intermediate sea level scenarios. And that's the graph that you've got on your screen right now. 
And what that basically is telling us is that over the next period of time, and we, we really are looking out to 2050 at this point, we should expect to see 20 inches of sea level rise in the state of Connecticut by 2050. And that's, that's a projection, this is a model. Um, we will be reviewing that every 10 years and we may find that's accelerating or we may find that it, it, we're actually working towards one of the lower models. But 20 inches by 2050 is quite a bit of, of impact. And in the state of Connecticut, that's gonna impact over 4,500 homes um, that are worth over $3.5 billion um, in today's dollars. And in today's dollars, that's 52 million in, in tax uh, revenues that we could see significantly impacted and reduced if, if that happens. We are also going to be looking at projected increases in temperatures. Um, and this is again coming out of Circa's their PSCAR report, um, which I think, uh, I'm not sure what that stands for. Um, uh, uh, Julia could probably tell me what the Peace Guard report is, but basically that, this is a report that looks at, and they've modeled, again, it's a model that has looked at projected temperature over the next 100 years, basically. And the black line is showing kind of what we have observed right now. And the red line um, is showing what our projections are. And that sort of, gray, uh, the red sort of uh, shaded area is, is the uh, degree of, of uh, you know what we could see, we could see high versus low in that. So that's the impact potential. But what that's really saying is that again by 2050, if we use that as our, our date, and that's only 30 years from now, uh, the on an average annual basis, the air is going to warm up to five degrees Fahrenheit. And what that means to us is that we're going to have longer growing seasons, which means that we may have multiple generations of insects who could then. Uh, eat our food or whatever, but they could, we also could see disruptions in pollinator timing. I mean, I don't know, many of you may have read articles about apple orchards where the, uh, the because the growing season's larger, the apples start to bud early and then they get an early frost and that kills them and that, that we had a big die off um, a while back. But there's, uh, we're just not set for this fast of a temperature increase and it's gonna impact uh, a lot of our ecosystems. Well, the other thing that it will do is that warmer air actually can hold more water vapor. And so what this chart is showing us is the percent of increases on a, this is the total US, but you'll see that New England over there at 71%, the percent increases regionally in the amount of precipitation falling in what we're calling heavy rain events. And that's described as the top 1% of daily events. And this is uh, over a period of 1958 to 2012. But what it's basically saying is that the annual precipitation is also expected to increase by about four to five inches, again, by that 20, 2050 time period. So we're just gonna see more extreme rain events. We're gonna see higher temperatures and we're gonna see up to 20 inches of sea level rise. Um, and, and what does that mean for the town of Fairfield? That means we're gonna get a lot more of what we call nuisance flooding or sunny day flooding. Uh, we may get right now two or three times a year, we'll get this sort of major nuisance flooding where you can't drive on some, some several of the roads, particularly in the beach area. Um, that could go up to 26 times a year. Um, it could, it's a significant, it could be a significant jump. We're gonna get more intense rain events and we're probably gonna get more frequent and intense storms that will cause significant flooding. We all saw what happened to, to Sandy, but that, that impacts about 15% of the households in the town of Fairfield. So it's quite a significant impact. Um, let's talk a little bit about what some of we've seen over the past couple of years. The Rooster River flooding was a major flood. It had five to seven inches of rain over a very short period of time. Um, it impacted many, many homes. Many people had to be rescued and cars towed. Um, it was, it, and it, it impacted, um, it was basically because the Rooster River couldn't absorb that much water in that short a period of time. And it just flooded into the whole, all of its surrounding neighborhoods. And part of that is our fault. The Rooster River was never designed to, to do that. And we have man-made concrete. We channeled it in different ways that we probably shouldn't have. So it, it just wasn't ready for this kind of a rain event. And we're gonna see more and more of these rain events. Um, the sunny day flooding that we see now, maybe three, four, maybe five times a year, particularly down in the, in the beach area, it's where high tides are overflowing some of the lower bulkheads and they're coming in through our drainage systems because our tide gates and some of the ductbills aren't watertight. So we actually have water coming up through our, our drain hole covers and stuff and through our drains. Um, we're gonna start seeing that significantly more often going forward. 
And when you you know take that and use um, the increased tide uh, levels through astronomical high tide flooding, we're going to start seeing that even more frequently. And this is a couple pictures from a, a, a sort of a fairly major flood that happened this fall. You can see on the picture on the right, there is a, a mail truck. Uh, that was trying to drive through and deliver the mail and uh, just absolutely couldn't get through. It was three and four feet of water. It was, it was, and this, this was just a, a high tide. This was not a, a major um, rain event, but um, the downtown flooding happens as well during these more intense rain events. And this is, you can see a crosswalk on the left and just um, a truck trying to drive through part of the downtown Fairfield area. And this is, this is due to our storm drain systems just not able to handle an intense amount of water in a very short period of time. And then finally, um, I think all of you who certainly live in, in the town of Fairfield were aware of the impacts of Superstorm Sandy back in 2012. Um, Connecticut is uh, second only to Florida with the percent of populations who live in coastal communities. Um, in the state of Connecticut, there are over 32,000 homes in various floodplains across the state and over $542 billion worth of assets at risk. Um, these are just a few pictures of what we saw in Sandy, and this was not even a hurricane. Um, this was a, a, a coastal tropical storm at the time. So if you were to kind of do some mapping uh, where you can sort of map the impact of increased water levels in a category one or two hurricane, this is a, a picture of the town of Fairfield uh, below route, below uh, 90, I-95. And you'll see all of those areas in the dark orange uh, would be underwater at a category one or two hurricane, assuming a, a strong storm surge uh, like we saw in Sandy, but at higher wind levels. So this this is this impacts about fifteen percent of the housing stock um, in the town. It's and it's a huge impact, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But what I wanted to do is switch over to the good things now. So what is Fairfield doing to try to mitigate these impacts? So from a Rooster River mitigation standpoint, uh, this is a picture of the Rooster River area. You can see the river sort of running through it, and then there's some gray hatched areas. And these are all potential sites for detention basins. And what this would do, a detention basin is basically you would create um, areas where you can hold water uh, such that it, it wouldn't run off um, and, and start to flood, but it would basically retain the water in these sort of basins that you'd create and build um, to allow it to sort of more slowly seep in so it doesn't uh, raise the, the river level as much and it doesn't push as much water into the stream and into the streets. Uh, so we're looking to fund uh, several of these and we've uh, got a, a engineering firm working with us to figure out which one is going to help us the most and do the, the best job at retaining that water so that we don't get the level of flooding we got. From a downtown Fairfield standpoint, many of you probably saw the work that was done uh, recently in Sherman Green, where we installed a large detention system um, and a number of, of dry wells and various catch basins in, in, the, in the downtown area. That was all funded by a 300,000 small town economic grant assistance program. Um, we haven't finished all of the work in the downtown. There's still work to be done, but we'll be doing that um, as we go and as funds permit. But, uh, but that even just the detention basin that was put in in Sherman Green should really help a lot from a downtown flooding standpoint. And the beach area mitigation is probably the toughest area for the town of Fairfield because originally this all this area that you see in the beach, which is over 3000 homes, six churches, several schools, the museum, the town hall, multiple historical buildings, the fire police and senior centers and over 250 commercial buildings, all of this originally was swampy marshland that we made the choice to build on. And now with sea level rise, that's gonna come back because the water will flow where it will flow. And if you have the impact of 20 inches of sea level rise and a cat one or two storm, uh, what this map is showing is uh, flooding projections of which streets are gonna be uh, significantly underwater. Um, and this is actually showing it just on a sunny day flooding. Th th this is now showing that with sea level rise by 2080, all these streets will be under underwater uh, uh, every 20, every 30 days, once every 30 days. Whereas now you're not seeing anywhere near that. You might get a little flooding on Fearful Beach Road, but this is going to, it's going to just get, the impact will be more and more. And when you think about it right now, the town of Fairfield has the most residential real estate of any Connecticut town. And that real estate is critical to the town's tax base. Um, there is a lot of, of tax revenue that is generated by these houses in the beach area. And if those houses all start to decline 
in value, that means that the taxes that the town can get from those houses is going to be less. And we're gonna have to make that up in the rest of Fairfield and or cut back services, which, which no one wants to do. So we, as the Flood and Erosion Control Board had actually put together a plan in 2015 and uh, we were working with the Army Corps of Engineers selected the town of Fairfield to do a deep dive um, in 2019. And they basically worked with us and with the engineering department and with DPW and we put together this and, and, and planning and zoning and we put together this plan that will allow, uh, that basically would allow the town of Fairfield to protect itself from the 500 year storm. But there was a, and it's a, through a series of seawalls and, and enhanced dunes. And you can kind of see these little lines that go across, there's little blue lines and green lines and yellow lines. That basically is sort of a, a barrier that goes over 23,000 feet. We would create basically physical barriers, if you will, to keep the water out. But the cost of that is, is huge. It's $546 million. Uh, of which the town of Fairfield would have to pay a third of it uh, or $180 million. Um, at this point, it is, it's not moving forward because it just doesn't meet a high enough cost benefit ratio to secure federal funds. So, so, so we can't, we don't have 546 million to do ourselves. We, we don't really want to spend that much money certainly right now, but what can we do? We can do some sort of small pieces of that and, and the, do the pieces that are gonna make the most impact for the town. So the, the first thing we're doing, and it's, it's in process right now, is what we're calling hardening the wastewater treatment plant. And that is, as you know, when, when you get a lot of storm surge and waves that can go over into your sewer system, it takes it all the sewage and, and pushes it back into Long Island Sound, which is a horrible thing. And no one wants that. So by hardening it, what we're doing is we're actually creating a berm around our sewage treatment plant, which will allow the water not to get in. So that's, that's going on right now. The, we've, uh, we're looking at what we're calling the South Benson Pump Station. And what that is, is sort of think of it as a massive pump that would be able to remove all of the sandy level water in under a day. San, the water that, san, that stayed in kind of that downtown floodplain area stayed for three, four to five days and caused huge amounts of damage to the houses. But if we could get it out quickly, it wouldn't, it wouldn't have anywhere near the impact that it had in Superstorm Sandy. So that pump station is fairly expensive. It's around 27 million, but um, that's actually sitting in the RTM budget for discussion. And hopefully we will get that approved because that would be a, a, a huge impact to be able to at least get the water out quickly. We're, other, we're exploring other things like raising Fairfield Beach Road, uh, re-looking at some tide gates, lots of other things. Um, but the most important thing we can, you can do as a resident is think about how you want to elevate your house, which would mitigate uh, the impact of the water getting into your house. It wouldn't impact the water getting into the floodplain, but at least it would go in and out um, as the tide went out again. Um, two other things that I'd like us to start exploring in the future, we, we don't have budget for this now, but these are ways to mitigate the impact of, that the wave impact can have on the houses and try to get beach replenishment going so that we can create um, less erosion. Um, so this is uh, something that from an Army Corps of Engineer uh, review of their North Atlantic Coast Resiliency Adaptation uh, pr uh, study that they did. Um, where you could look at something like I'm calling them I'm calling them living breakwaters, but basically you create a breakwater out off off the beach. We could make it a living breakwater, so it could have oysters on it, and they could uh, create a, a habitat um, for some of our ecosystems. But it's expensive. But what it does do is it it uh, sand. You'll notice these sort of scalloped areas of sand. Sand accretes behind these, and it builds up the sand on the beaches to uh, mitigate some of the beach erosion we're seeing, and it helps protect. And it's not going to protect. It's not going to keep the water out. The water's still going to come in, but it might. It, it should be able to help mitigate some of the wave impacts. So you won't get damage from the waves. But it's expensive. These are um, these run about nine thousand dollars per foot to do. And, and right now, it would be a bit of a permitting challenge uh, from our Connecticut Deep, um, who who prefer uh, more softer um, erosion control structures. Another thing that I have a lot of heart for at least exploring uh, would be, we have a series of groins right now in the town of Fairfield. And what happens in a groin system, these are basically um, rock jetties that go uh, perpendicular to the beach. Um, and what they do is they sort of capture the sand. Sand normally uh, sort of flows, the, the, the water pushes the sand 
in a literal transport sort of it moves it along the beach, if you will. And what the groins do is they sort of capture it on one side of the groin. So you'll see in picture one, on the left side, you've got sand captured and on the right side, you actually uh, don't have a lot of sand at all because of that literal transport is being interrupted by the groins. So if you look at something like picture two, and if you put something like a spur in there or a T at the end of the groin or something like that, that allows you to capture sand on, on possibly both sides of the groin. Um, so these are ways that we can look at uh, beach replenishment that might make some sense. But again, these are expensive options and we need to evaluate whether it's right for our beach conditions and our wave conditions and our tidal conditions. Um, so that, those are some of the things that Flood and Erosion Control Board uh, will be working with the town and looking at. But what we as, as individuals can all do are some small things to mitigate our own impact on climate change. We can all reduce our dependence on fossil fuels and support green energy options. Um, insulating our homes is probably the number one thing we can do because it re reduces your heating bill so significantly. And it's not that expensive. The payback is, is reasonably good. Um, we could all consider solar or EV cars, consider walking and biking instead of driving. We could support our local food and consider eating less meat. Um, all of you, I'm sure, have seen um, the impact, as much as I love my steaks and hamburgers, the impact that meat has on the, on the CO2 and, and methane is, is, is fairly significant. And then finally, managing our trash and recycling and consider composting or re recycling food waste. So that's, um, that's the end of my presentation. And again, if you have any questions on this, go down right now and go to the bottom and type in any questions and we'll answer them at the end. And I'm now gonna pass this along to Juliana Barrett, who will speak about some of the other impacts of climate change. Okay. So, here we go. Can you see my screen? Has that come up? Yeah, you're fine, Juliana. Okay, yeah. good, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna pick up um, and emphasize a few things that um, Becky was talking about in terms of the impacts of climate change here in Connecticut. So as she said, you know, things are getting warmer, our, our air temperatures are increasing. Um, we're having um, more heat in the winter, so less snow and ice. Um, and we're having more frequent days over 90 degrees here throughout the Northeast, but especially here in Connecticut. So that's leading to more heat waves. And in terms of planning within a community, it could be um, thinking about things like the next time a school is built, do we need to include air conditioning in the school? Uh, many schools had to close um, in the fall the past couple of years because the temperatures were just too warm. So something to think about. Um, and that's also related to heat illness and, and things that we might need to consider in terms of ha our hazard mitigation planning. On the flip side, um, our growing season is about two weeks longer and the agricultural community is absolutely thinking about some of the new um, vegetables and fruits that could become crops here in Connecticut. Um, the one thing that we really don't know, though, is, is um, when we might have a, a freeze, for example. So we had all those wonderful adages, um, like don't plant until the last full moon in May. Um, or there was one that I heard, um, don't plant until the, the frogs, um, the peepers have frozen at least three times. Um, so, so those don't work anymore because we really don't know when during you know, a much warmer spring, we could have one of these snap freezes. And as Becky mentioned, um, with warmer air temperature, we have warmer water temperature. Um, and there's been a lot of research in Long Island Sound. We're seeing more and more tropical fish coming up. The African pompano, Atlantic moonfish are two examples. We're seeing many more blue crabs. Um, not necessarily a bad thing, but we've, we've lost our, our um, lobster fisheries for a number of reasons, part of which has been these warmer water temperatures. So as Becky mentioned, 20 inches by 2050, looking at sea level rise, um, and certainly is impacting roads and, and other infrastructure. 
um, but our coastal habitats are also being impacted by this. So here you see a, a salt marsh. And because here in the Northeast, um, the sea levels are rising at a very high rate, um, most salt marshes are not able to keep up in terms of uh, sedimentation and growth rates of the plants sedimenting into the marsh. Um, and so we're seeing a couple of things happening. Marshes are migrating landward where it's possible for them to do so. And in some areas, um, the marshes are getting wetter. And so we're losing um, some of the marsh habitats due to um, sea level rise. Um, and Becky mentioned um, this study, um, SLAM is sea level affecting marsh model. So this is Connecticut Deep partnered with a consulting firm that did a series of marsh modeling. And they looked at, um, I think it's about 20 of the largest marshes along the Connecticut coast, as well as all the roadways. Um, and you can go to Yukon CT Eco and look at a viewer that will show you um, the model projections for our marshes, where um, they're expected to drown, where they're expected to migrate landward, where the elevations of the land um, are, are gentle enough to allow for marsh migration and where there's no roads. Um, and then as Becky mentioned, um, you can also see where roadways are, are projected to flood under different scenarios. Um, with all the carbon dioxide being absorbed into our oceans, we're seeing uh, acidification, carbon dioxide plus water um, leading to carbonic acid. And um, if you remember from, from high school chemistry, um, pH is a logarithmic scale. So pre-industrial revolution, the average pH of our oceans was 8.2. Currently it's about 8.1. Connecticut DEP has um, a whole water quality monitoring program of which looking at the, the conductivity or the pH is part of that. Um, and I mentioned pH because we always hear the news about the corals. But here in Connecticut, we have a phenomenal shellfish industry worth millions of dollars, very, very um, important industry and recreational um, aspect as well. And it's the very, very young shellfish that are impacted by ocean acidification, um, by these, these um, higher acidities. And it prevents the very young um, shellfish uh, larva to actually lay down shell or it's misformed. Um, and so this is why ocean acidification can also be another critical impact from climate change. And again, um, will we have more storms like this? And I think Becky made a really important point that when um, Sandy hit, it wasn't even a, a hurricane anymore when it hit the Connecticut coast at least. And um, there's, there's a lot of work going on on projecting whether or not we're going to have um, more storms, but certainly most scientists agree that the storms that we have will be more intense. Um, and this is a picture of Sandy, a satellite image of Sandy. Um, after Irene, if you all remember, uh, in 2011, uh, Tropical Storm Irene went up the Connecticut River Valley and caused a huge amount of destruction up in Vermont with these very, very heavy rains. And this is all sediment coming down the Connecticut River flowing into Long Island Sound. And so um, not just flooding, but these impacts on water quality can be really, really serious. And then I've, I'm sure you've all seen um, beach closures um, and shellfish harvesting closures um, due to whether it's a major storm event or just a heavy, heavy rain event um, can certainly trigger closings um, of both beaches and shellfish harvesting. And then we have these issues with coastal erosion and, and sedimentation. Um, this is, these were photographs after uh, Irene. And here on the bottom, you can see an exposed septic system. Um, sediment used to go up to this line here and it was just all washed away. This is a seawall that was broken during Irene 
and you can see the scouring that occurred on the landward side. So it's not just that things get scoured out in front of seawalls, but behind them as well. And then Becky, as Becky mentioned, really serious impacts um, in terms of loss of our tax base. And one thing we, we don't really think too much about here in Connecticut um, is drought. And there's a US drought monitor and certainly not something that we have to think about in the next coming weeks. But back in 2017, we did have some extreme drought here in Connecticut. And so it can never hurt us to be thinking about water conservation measures. Um, it could be as easy as having a rain barrel to water your garden. Um, so something to think about. And then thinking about some of the um, human impacts, right? And so we've talked about extreme heat. Um, climate change is causing changes to our air quality, making it much poorer. We've seen some incredible photographs of Los Angeles with um, a few weeks of having no cars that, that the air quality has improved so much. So, you know, here's these really um, striking um, visual images that we can see of the impacts that we're having and a few weeks of, of not driving is making a huge difference. Um, certainly the flooding, both just the simple high tide flooding um, to the storm events. Lyme disease um, and vector-borne diseases is something that has really been increasing as uh, changes in temperature are happening. And this is not just within Connecticut, but um, throughout the United States, we're seeing a huge spread of things like Lyme disease. Um, and one other thing I wanted to mention, these mental health issues. Um, and this is something that we've really seen after Hurricane Maria down in Puerto Rico um, are essentially PTSD and people who have been through these extreme um, uh, hurricane events, wiping everything out that is really affecting mental health. So I think that's something that we really need to be thinking about. And then there's the secondary impacts. Um, for example, when homes flood, we have, we have all these, um, may have all these mold issues. So many health issues to consider with climate change. Um, this is just a, a nice visual um, in terms of Lyme disease and some of the um, impacts with that. So just to mention a few other things that we can do, I wanna talk a little bit about living shorelines, um, riparian buffers, and then um, some of the ways that um, students are really helping out with climate impacts and communities. So um, Becky had mentioned um, the idea of these hybrid living shorelines, um, and they are very expensive, um, but they help um, maintain that land water interface that you could really see in the diagram that she was showing um, with those, those rock sills um, protecting the beach. And living shorelines are a way to stabilize our shorelines using plants and other natural materials sometimes combined with harder materials like rock. And these are important to think about because this is a nice graphic out of NOAA one square mile of salt marsh stores a huge amount of carbon. So that whole idea of carbon sequestration. Um, salt marshes are one of the most productive ecosystems in the world. Um, so whatever we can do to maintain these, these salt marshes can be extremely helpful. Um, they trap sediment coming in. Um, they also work to improve water quality and provide all that fisheries habitat, a great deal of biodiversity, um, allowing for um, canoeing, kayaking, boating, fishing, all sorts of recreational and tourism activities. Um, and here's a really interesting point. Um, 15 feet of marsh can absorb 50% of the incoming wave energy. So 15 feet isn't all that much. Um, and that's the wave energy can be one of those elements that is so critical in terms of um, controlling erosion. Studies that were done uh, down in the Carolinas after several of the major storms down there showed that this idea of living shorelines, um, that these are much more resilient during storm events versus things like bulkheads and other hardened structures. 
Um, and there is an expectation that a third of the shorelines in the US will be hardened by 2100, decreasing a lot of our coastal habitat. And by hardening, I mean this, this is putting up some sort of a hard structure, whether it's a seawall, a jetty, or groin, or so on. There's going to be places where we absolutely need to use hard structures, as Becky mentioned, with the wastewater treatment plant, right? But there are other places where we can think about using more natural elements and protecting that land water interface and our coastal habitats. So here's an example. Um, showing a marsh edge that's been eroding. And by putting in this fiber log, all natural materials, it gets staked in and you can see little green sprigs here. So it's planted with the salt marsh grasses. Um, so here's a, a very simple way to control erosion along this type of shoreline. And many of you have probably seen um, pictures of the reef balls at the Audubon property down in Stratford. Um, this is a project led by Sacred Heart University and Jennifer Matai, um, and she gives really wonderful talks about this. But so these are reef balls, these are concrete structures that are put in, um, and you can see that there's space so as to allow organisms to move in and out. This obviously was taken at low tide. Um, and the whole idea is that wave energy slows down as it hits these concrete structures and deposit sediment behind it. And you can see this marsh is building up here behind the, the reef balls. Um, and she has all sorts of students um, who have been working on projects to see what organisms settle on the inside. Um, during high tide, they put in uh, underwater GoPro cameras and can see what fish and other organisms are using the reef balls. So there's a huge amount going on here um, and it's a wonderful, experiment that is very fortunately working. I just want to uh, mention real quickly at, at University of Connecticut, we have a program called the Climate Corps, where undergraduate students take a course on climate change, really learning about the local impacts, um, how municipalities work, how government works here in Connecticut, and, and what are the barriers to moving forward on different climate change projects. And then in the second semester, students have the opportunity to work with a community um, on an independent study project where they do a project on um, climate adaptation. Um, many, many of the students have done projects such as beach resilience plans for communities, um, looking at uh, vulnerability assessments for a particular area of a community. Um, working on outreach materials. So keep this in mind um, if you have any projects that you think students might be able to do over the course of a semester. And finally, just something to think about a little bit further inland um, are the importance of vegetated buffers. So not only is our ocean waters and the waters of Long Island Sound getting warmer, but many of our streams and rivers. And this is where there's a lot of um, freshwater fish and by maintaining vegetated buffers, um, we can really help cool these more inland waterways. And then finally, I just wanted to show an example of how um, the arts are really getting incorporated into climate change. This is a climate change haiku that was written um, by a gentleman and he took the 19 points of the um, IPCC report on climate change and he put each one into a haiku. So here's an example of that. And this is available online from the um, Sightline Institute. So um, Emmeline is gonna be talking about the POCD, the Plan of Conservation and Development for the town of Fairfield. Um, the state of Connecticut is working on both the mitigation um, that is controlling greenhouse gas emissions and the adaptation side. Many of the universities throughout um, Connecticut are involved in some aspect of climate change, as are many of our um, NGOs. Um, people are really needed to be part of this, um, whether it's volunteering. I think I'm sure um, Fairfield is always looking for volunteer commission members. So there's, there's uh, many, many ways to get involved. And while there's really no easy answers, um, there is a lot of forward progress going on within our state and communities are happy to share their stories.
So I think that's it for me. I'm gonna stop sharing and pass it over to Emmeline. I think you're still on mute. I just need to share there we my go. screen. But let's see. And come on. Okay. Um, so thank you to um, the Sustainable Fairfield Task Force for having me today and um, uh, Mary and Becky for putting this together. Um, so I'm gonna really kind of switch gears and talk specifically about Fairfield's plan of conservation and development um, and how we incorporate climate change policies within the POCD. Um, I, I really wanna talk a bit about what the POCD is. Um, what does it do? So um, I just wanna be clear that this is really a policy document. So it's a document to talk about land use goals and policy um, specifically, and this is of course implicit in its, in its um, title, but for economic development and natural resource protection and conservation. Um, so within a POCD, you really identify projects and best practices that are consistent with the policies that you wanna advance for the town of Fairfield. Um, I think what's also important is that you can identify future planning studies needed um, that would be consistent with the policies that you hope to uh, move forward. It's not a document that answers all questions. It's a document that kind of says, here's the direction that Fairfield wants to move in within the next 10 years. Um, but the other thing that it can do is it can inform uh, future regulation, both within uh, the local code, code of ordinances and then more specifically um, within the zoning regulations itself. So what it what it isn't is it's not a land use um, you know it's not it's not a land use um, or other specific regulation document, um, and it's also generally not very specific to individual sites. It's broad to areas. Um, with the exception of large acquisition targets or other sites that need outside uh, funding, whether through grants or uh, other programs. And the other thing that it's not used for is it's, it's generally not used for enforcement. Again, this is kind of identifying how does Fairfield wanna move forward. Um, Fairfield is, uh, participates in the sustainable CT program and our current plan of conservation and development um, meets many of the sustainability standards within the sustainable CT program. But, you know, I think that it's been uh, made pretty clear through some of the recent outreach meetings that we've done uh, that people really do kind of identify with some of the challenges of climate change. And, um, you know, I think some of the comments that we've gotten in some of our recent meetings with um, Fairfield residents, there's certainly more policy that we can put within our plan of conservation and development to promote and uh, support um, both initiatives that uh, allow us to successfully adapt um, and hopefully um, prevent some of the uh, climate change impacts. So uh, these are implicit in uh, compact land use patterns. Um, so, you know, not that we're going to kind of recreate all of Fairfield, but there are certainly things that we can do to kind of institute land use patterns that haven't been common. Um, at least in the recent, I think, 100, 100 or so years in, in Fairfield, where we have kind of, I think, more compact um, neighborhoods uh, in terms of, you know, mixed use and, and all of that. Also increased transportation alternatives. Uh, Fairfield residents have kind of made it clear that they're interested in um, getting out of their cars and allowing them better access, multimodal access uh, within the town itself. Uh, the other thing, and I think both uh, Becky and uh, Juliana touched on this, is greenways and continuous, contiguous open spaces, habitat areas, and waterway buffer areas um, are, you know, kind of recognized as needed. Um, and a lot of these uh, kind of lead us towards a more resilient fair field in terms of, you know, how do we better respond to some of the impacts that we know are coming with climate change. Um, I think certainly, uh, even with, I think, the COVID-19 crisis that we face today, um, it's become pretty clear that, you know, we, we, uh, we have to be very careful about putting all of our eggs in one basket, um, even nationally, um, or even like internationally, the fact that so much of our manufacturing has moved to overseas makes it very difficult in challenging circumstances to um, have access to some of the things that we as a population need. 
Um, I know for many years, this has kind of really put a, a focus and a light on local and regional agriculture. Um, given our property values here in Fairfield, it is not realistic to assume that huge swaths of our community uh, is going to convert to agriculture, but people can kind of, um, you know, help with their kind of local uh, fruit production for their families um, through, you know, looking at more um, uh, initiatives like on their own properties or within the town itself. Um, I wanted to identify through this process, I think, where the state statute also kind of points us in the right direction uh, in regards to climate change and with the understanding that Connecticut's been fairly progressive, uh, both in terms of as a greenhouse gas uh, reduction uh, partner regionally um, and, um, you know, several other initiatives by the DEP. But within the state statute, you know, we are mandated to look for, um, the, to understand that we do have a need for affordable housing and that we do need to expand housing opportunities. I think that we've been uh, fairly fortunate in a partner uh, that produces um, higher quality uh, affordable housing choices within the town of Fairfield. And the photo shown is the Pine Tree Apartments. I know that in many of the outreach meetings, we discussed um, accessory apartments, what's presently allowed, and whether people had strong feelings about whether we expand how those are allowed to not really change the fabric of what Fairfield is today, but to kind of tuck in additional units where we can. Part of the POCD per state statute that we're required to address is the protection of public surface and drinking water supply. Um, you know, I think that our conservation department, uh, in, certainly within their regulatory structure and their project review, are uh, very strong advocates for uh, this process. I think that our um, existing POCD probably just needs clearer language that helps support them in that mission um, moving forward. Uh, it also promotes the use of solar and other renewable forms of energy and energy conservation. Um, I think that for the town of Fairfield itself, we have certainly, um, as a municipality, um, understood that um, adding things such as the Fairfield landfill solar array on, um, on the former landfill that you can see on the left in the photo on the left, as well as um, solar panels on many of our public buildings not only is better for the environment, but also helps our bottom line um, in terms of the municipal budget. Um, so uh, you can see Fairfield Ward High School on the, on the right-hand side there and the, the gray patches that you can see on the roof, those are all solar panels. Um, I think Fairfield has been fairly committed to adding solar where we can. Um, and hopefully some of our private uh, part, commercial partners in the community will also um, start to understand that it's, a, it's not only just a better way to help the environment, but also a way to help their bottom line moving forward. Uh, the POCD is also required to identify protection and preservation of agriculture. Um, in Fairfield, we have a strong um, agricultural history. I mean, I think most of uh, most Fairfielders um, know the local history of the extensive onion farms that used to be in uh, the northern parts of Fairfield. And really what the um, POCD is required to identify is where we have prime farmland soils and uh, farmland soils that of statewide importance and where possible to really um, protect those because you know, farming is really kind of dependent upon existing conditions, um, you know, to do it rather successfully without, I think, um, burdening adjacent water sources through bringing in, uh, you know, heavily uh, high nitrogen fertilizers and things like that. So you really, you know, you want to start where, um, you want to start where you can, where the soils are best to um, be more successful in terms of agriculture. However, what I would say is that, you know, when you look at Fairfield, there are areas where we have highly dense neighborhoods and areas where we have um, obviously, um, you know, larger properties. And even in those highly dense areas, you know, agriculture can be as, um, as small scale as uh, promoting some areas where we can um, install more community gardens. Um, and we can certainly, and I know the sustainable uh, Fairfield Task Force has done this through some of their programming that they've done this week is help encourage and um, teach people how to do 
small scale gardens on their own properties. Um, as both Becky and Juliana mentioned, uh, we, do, we are required by state statute within our POCD um, to plan for the most recent sea level rise scenario as provided to us by uh, Yukon's Institute for Resiliency and Climate Adaptation, uh, CIRCA. So uh, we are using that benchmark of that 20 inches um, in our planning documents. And, um, you know, part of, part of what I wanted to bring up in terms of what Becky said is, you know, this was a rather extensive planning process by the Army Corps of Engineers. And sometimes what you learn through, uh, you know, something that kind of embraces a policy issue at a very, very broad scale is that you need to kind of identify how do you break that up into the, into parts, um, both in terms of projects and in terms of um, additional planning. So I think, um, you know, in, in response to the good work that the Army Corps did, uh, that may be where I think some of our sea level rise recommendations fall is, you know, we need to kind of probably break this up a bit. Um, the other, the other POCD uh, policy is objectives of energy efficient patterns of development. Um, compact, transit accessible, pedestrian oriented, mixed use development patterns and land reuse. Uh, we see this actually significantly at the Metro Center site uh, with the addition of that new train station in 2011. Um, and with some planning work that was done at that time, uh, we are very thankful that uh, the Trademark One building was able to utilize the, the, the policy guidance of our, of our prior POCD. Uh, our existing POCD um, and the regulations that resulted as, a, as part of that work. Um, and of course we have trademark two that's under construction at this time. And then, you know, recently because of the work that was done and the thought that office would be a good fit for that site, we recognized that, you know, the office market had changed. You know, we need to kind of be flexible and dynamic, um, and also, I think, resilient to uh, changing market forces. Um, and so we recently completed a transit-oriented development study um, that re-looked at what, what, is, what is the market looking for today? And not only that, but how do we kind of solve multiple issues that we have in Fairfield, such as a lack of diversity in housing, um, housing options? Um, by this, um, you know, what has been for us a really important redevelopment area um, in, in the Metro Center. So, you know, the, I think some of the transit oriented development study is going to translate into uh, the POCD, of course, uh, with this update as well. Uh, protection of environmental assets critical to public health and safety. Um, I do feel like, and I know that, um, you know, we've had this conversation with the uh, Flood Erosion Control Board that. You know, part of Fairfield's um, uh, issues is related to public health and safety is that where we have um, uh, really dense uh, built environment, sometimes it encroaches rather significantly on our natural environment. So we need to kind of figure out how to be thoughtful in terms of creating more space. Um, you know, I think some of the Rooster River flood damage that you can see really relates to the built environment encroaching a little too closely on what would be you know, kind of natural forces at work. Uh, we know that floodplains flood, that's part of their, that's part of their natural design. But unfortunately, where we see damage is where we put infrastructure and structures in the way of where we anticipate that there will be higher than normal flooding conditions. So I think we need to be a little bit thoughtful about that moving forward and figure out whether we can give some of these natural systems a little bit more breathing room here in Fairfield. Um, what was overwhelmingly clear to us through, through our outreach meetings in the winter was that um, the policy um, goal within the state statute to plan for open space acquisition and greenway protection and development is something that a majority of Fairfielders support. Um, Fairfielders want to get out of their cars. They want to be connected by multimodal um, opportunities, whether it's walking from place to place or biking from place to place. Um, and again, I think um, targeting some of these natural pathways, providing an opportunity for additional flood storage um, with the co-benefit of expanding uh, natural habitat corridors 
and providing multimodal opportunities, it seems like a win-win for Fairfielders. Uh, I'm just gonna briefly touch on some of the, com uh, the workshop comments that we got. Um, in terms of sustainability, um, you Fairfielders love your pollinator pathways. And so we were very excited that so many people, and I don't know whether, you know, what was nice about this, the workshops that we did in January um, and February, and you can see some of the photos on the right of people interacting with one another. Um, what we really tried to do and what people kind of did naturally is they just sat, we tell people you have to sit at a table with maps. And um, what they ended up doing was sitting with other Fairfielders who they, who they weren't already deeply engaged in either in their volunteer work or just through their regular uh, neighborhoods. And so it was really kind of surprising to us the commonalities that were discussed, um, as well as you know, some of the very friendly differences that were, um, that were placed on the maps um, and were put in some of the questionnaires. Um, but what seemed fairly consistent is that people in Fairfield have a very strong relationship with um, some of the natural amenities within the community. Um, and they really wanna figure out ways to expand those. So uh, promoting pollinator pathways, both on people's personal properties, as well as on our public properties was a very strong statement. Um, Helping the public understand what best practices might be was also a strong statement in terms of natural versus chemical lawn protocols, um, habitat friendliness plantings, native plantings. Uh, they also feel very strongly that um, you know we need to kind of reduce some of the paved areas on residential properties, uh, whether that was a concern based on flooding or just you know air quality of water bodies that are adjacent. Um, expanding recycling, including uh, adding something for food waste, um, expanding the arts by adding an arts council here locally, upgrading uh, stormwater systems, uh, more small community gardens, electric car incentives, looking at electric school buses, more community solar. Um, and, you know, I think one of the biggest features outside of the Rooster River is, of course, the Mill River. And people felt that, uh, you know, we needed to kind of look at the Mill River and make sure that it's as clean as it could be. In terms of sea level rise and resiliency, um, I think these touch on many of the comments that Becky had mentioned uh, in terms of what the Flood Erosion Control Board is looking at. Um, I think there is you know, an overwhelming understanding that we need to both balance protection of the natural environment near the shoreline, but we also need to figure out how to balance that with protecting um, the neighborhoods that are down there. Um, it's, you know, even though these neighborhoods were really only created in the post-war era, you know, really in the 1950s, um, these are really um, very comprehensive neighborhoods. There's schools, as Becky mentioned, there's churches. Um, these, are, these are very kind of nice scale neighborhoods. Um, so, but we do recognize, you know, long-term, we need to kind of figure out where we can retreat uh, where we need room for some alternative methods, like uh, I think even some of the um, uh, work that I think Becky mentioned, and certainly in the Army Corps study, what we understand is that um, because of these very nice kind of walkable neighborhoods that were created in the 50s down by the beach, it doesn't give us a lot of room to kind of work in protection mechanisms. Um, so we need to kind of figure out how to do that a bit. Um, so I'm not going to read through all of these, but uh, just, uh, you know, these will be available in the recording of the workshop if you want to go back to look at these more specifically. And our hope is to have a webinar coming up in the future where we can um, provide some of these comments to everyone about what, you know, what Fairfielders said uh, during these outreach workshops. Uh, most importantly, Fairfield's Plan of Conservation and Development is a potential funding document. Um, and we try to let both Fairfielders understand this, department heads understand this, um, and also our boards and commissions. Um, when we, we don't want it to be, again, so specific that we're not talking about the broad policy goals uh, and objectives for Fairfield, but we do need to kind of be mindful that the, the POCD is a document that is always, you know, I think when you apply for grants and funding, 
um, you always have to re re recognize, well, where was your planning? How did your community decide that you wanted to move forward on X, Y, or Z? Um, so this is both for future planning, for projects, for purchases, um, and also to prioritize the town budgeting. Um, the, the parcel that I show in this photograph uh, for 760 Oldfield Road was successful with the DEP open space um, grant application, um, in part because our POCD mentioned, um, you know, as a priority, um, you know, wanting to protect uh, naturalized marsh spaces. And so some of that language really assisted in making this an attractive uh, grant application for the DEP to award. Um, in prioritizing town budgeting, you know, I think one of the things that's kind of come up in terms of resiliency is what is the town able to do? Um, I know that Branford, uh, I believe last year, uh, set aside some resiliency funding. I think they put a million dollars into a fund to help with future resiliency projects. Um, for the POCD, uh, that can also help prioritize uh, the capital improvement plan that's done every single year. Um, you know, to help kind of decide, you know, are these projects that the town has kind of talked about that we really need to move forward on? Um, so that's really all I have in terms of um, where the PCO, uh, sorry, the POCD uh, informs both, uh, you know, climate change policy and, you know, where it, it, it hopes to um, inform some of the um, adaptations and incentives for better behavior in terms of, um, you know, what we can do as a town. So that's all I have. Well, thank you, Emily. And thank you, Juliana. This was an amazing presentation. I think I certainly learned a lot. Um, I don't know if anyone has any questions. I'm looking in to see if there are any questions in. So there's one question. Um, New Jersey took over coastal properties post Sandy. What consideration has Connecticut given to this approach after hurricane events? I don't know who wants to take that. Emily, do you want to take that or Juliana? Well, I think, I mean, I can only answer it to a certain extent. It really depends on the coastal properties themselves. I think a lot of coastal property in New Jersey was already, um, especially on the Jersey Shore portion, um, that was already public um, because they have a rather large um, uh, seawall, constructed seawall that runs a good portion of the Jersey Shore. So the properties, uh, the, the quote unquote property um, waterward of that seawall is actually publicly owned already. And that big seawall is maintained by, um, you know, the, uh, the municipalities that are adjacent to it is, is what I understand. Um, also, New Jersey has uh, what they call um, a Blue Acres Acquisition Program. So they are able, they have, they have state funding that's kind of squirreled away to acquire properties. And they really did try to do that in some areas, both post Irene and Sandy, especially in marshland areas where given sea level rise projections, um, it wasn't that likely that the properties were, it was such a significant cost to elevate them. And it wasn't likely that these were gonna be properties that were going to be spared from impacts of sea level rise. So they did very kind of aggressively look to the specific neighborhood and say, oh, let's try to purchase all of these. Uh, West Haven did the same thing along First Avenue here in Connecticut. And they used um, NRCS, uh, NRCS funds um, to acquire those properties as a grouping as well. Um, that's always a good idea, especially when you can have a consistent acquisition um, specifically adjacent to like a singular waterway, um, because then you don't have this kind of jagged, jagged tooth response to, um, you know, allowing that uh, those properties go back to some sort of naturalized state. And if I could also jump in, that's one of the things that we, the Flood and Erosion Control Board has been also looking at the Brantford uh, Resiliency Fund that Emily mentioned as something that might make a lot of sense for the town of Fairfield, because having a fund like that would mean that you have funds available to be able to purchase properties as they come on the market without having to go through a very long process of getting approval through the various town bodies. You could actually take advantage of a fund that was designed to do something like that and you could act quickly 
before it gets snatched up by a real estate uh, flipper or a developer. Uh, and we could t protect and take the properties that make the most ecological and climate sense. Um, uh, so that, I think, are there any other questions? I don't have any other open questions. And I think we've pretty much run out of time. So I want to thank everyone uh, for participating, for joining. If you do have any other questions, feel free to get them to me uh, or anyone else um, uh, on, the, on the program today. We'd certainly be happy to answer them uh, later. And if you obviously, if you want to watch this again, it's on YouTube. But again, thank you so much to our participants, uh, Emily and, and Juliana. This was a, an amazing talk. And I really appreciate you guys taking the time to put the, your presentations together. We certainly learned a lot. So thank you all and uh, happy Earth Day. Good, thank you. All right.